Namaskara, hello, and welcome to the 2020 edition of the Bengaluru Poetry Festival. I'm Shikha Malvia, and today I'm in conversation with award-winning American poet, Annie Finch, author of 18 books and editor of the stunning landmark anthology, Choice Words, Writers on Abortion. This anthology was 20 years in the making and came out here in the U.S. on April 7th, right as the country was shutting down due to the coronavirus. What is so astonishing about this anthology is the breadth and depth of it, encompassing diverse voices and perspectives from different cultures, countries, and centuries, featuring pieces by well-known writers like Amy Tan and Margaret Atwood, alongside emerging writers as well. A very warm welcome to you, Annie. It is an absolute honor to have you be part of the Bangalore Poetry Festival and to see that India, Pakistan, and other South Asian countries have representation in this stupendous anthology. There is, in fact, this courageous sisterhood that goes beyond borders here in Choice Words, and I'm so honored to be part of that conversation as well. Annie is currently off grid on a writing retreat with a somewhat unreliable internet connection. And so we're conducting this very vital conversation by exchanging videos. Thanks so much for cooperating with us, Annie. So I wanna start with the foreword written by Katha Pollitt in which she says, abortion is always serious, as serious as birth. Why is it that we have so much difficulty talking about abortion and finding it in literature even, when clearly this is something that's been going on for centuries. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here and to be part of the festival. I found your questions incisive and illuminating, and they helped me to think about the book in a new way. So um, I will take them in the order in which you asked them, since we are here on the video. And your first question, uh, was about Katha Pollitt's introduction where she says abortion is as serious as birth. And as you say, it's been going on for such a long time, probably as long as birth, one would think. And yet, why do we have such trouble talking about it? And why is there such a silence in literature as well as in society about this central topic, this important aspect of human life? And I feel that this silence is a direct reflection of the power of patriarchy. And in fact, in different cultures, it might be commensurate with the power of patriarchy in those, in those places. Patriarchy is a very fragile system. That's why it has to be constantly imposing its power through laws, through controlling, through wars, through exploitation. Uh, it's not... I don't believe uh, natural, and there seems to be a lot of evidence that the original cultures were actually women-centered and matrilineal, uh, matriarchal. So patriarchy has to impose itself through this kind of force. And I, it seems to me that women's reproductive freedom exposes the fragility of patriarchy very strongly. And so it's much in the interest of patriarchy, or has been in the interest of patriarchy, to keep abortion very, very quiet and to make it a topic of shame and silence that women have felt that they needed to keep secret under patriarchy. Um, I feel that there are three reasons that abortion is such a direct threat to patriarchy. Legally, uh, reproductive freedom makes clear that women are human beings, that we have full legal rights, and that we have minds, bodies, hearts, wills, and spirits. We are doing something that is completely self-directed as human beings. And this is a threat to the patriarchy, which wants to see us as possessions and as some uh, beings that can be controlled as less than human. Um, economically, uh, women's reproductive freedom makes it clear that women have a natural power over children over the lines of succession. So again, a direct threat to the fragile idea that property and family should be passed on from man to man, as has been done under patriarchy for the last 4,000 years, 5,000 years or so. Um, it makes it clear that there's something fragile and uh, tenuous about that entire system of patrilineal uh, descent. 
and perhaps most importantly, the third thing, uh, reproductive freedom makes it spiritually clear that women have power over life and death, a very essential, deep, primal spiritual power. And, and there's, this is something that the patriarchy cannot control. And because religion um, has been often used as such a tool of patriarchal control, uh, this idea that women have a spiritual connection that's immediate and inherent and has such an integral connection with life and death, as women, of course, in so many cultures are the ones who take care of birth and also take care of death and the dying. Um, this is a, a natural part of women's work. But uh, reproductive freedom makes it so obvious that women have this spiritual primacy that, again, I find that that is a very direct threat to the patriarchy. So I think for these three reasons, the legal, economic, and spiritual threat that reproductive freedom poses to the patriarchy, women have felt the need to keep it quiet and not to talk about it. And this is reflected in the literature. Wow. Women have power over life and death. That is so true and so very emboldening and empowering and also so very sad that we're often told otherwise. Um, I think Choice Words brilliantly addresses this and other issues with patriarchy in its own vibrant and exploratory terms. Um, but I'd love for you, Annie, to share with us the impetus of this anthology and your vision in writing this. You ask about the impetus of the anthology and my vision in editing it. Well, the impetus of the anthology was very personal. I had an abortion at the age of 43, about 20 years ago. And at the time, I was um, a PhD in literature. I was teaching literature. And I was looking for literature that would reflect my experience. And as you pointed out in your first question, there really wasn't that kind of literature about abortion. Uh, there were just a few pieces here and there, um, a couple of the poems that ended up in the book by um, African-American poets, Gwendolyn Brooks and Lucille Clifton had a few pieces, but um, there was very, very little. So the impetus started out being looking for the kind of literature that I wanted to read and then as I edited the book over a 20-year period, um, it, it became more about my, my sense of the importance of having this conversation more openly uh, to, to create a conversation that would move beyond the shame and the silencing that, uh, that we were just talking about in the previous question that would open a new kind of conversation. So my vision for the book, the way it's organized into five sections, uh, mind, body, heart, will, and spirit, is based on the idea that abortion and reproductive choices represent all of these parts of ourselves and engage all of these parts of ourselves. So I wanted anyone to be able to pick up the book, whether it's someone who's had an abortion, someone who's curious about the topic, whether it's being used in a classroom or just for, for private reading or for activism. Those were the three uh, purposes that I had in mind for the book, that it would be used in, as a source of knowledge for the classroom or for individual information, that it would be a source of emotional comfort and, and reassurance and company and just a, a, a sense of knowing that one wasn't alone and that we have a lot of freedom in the way we handle these issues because it's been done in so many different ways. So in that sense, an individual uh, connection with the book. And the third vision I had for the book was that it could be used for uh, political organizing or um, for organizing for reproductive freedom, whether for fundraisers or for uh, getting together and having book talks, discussion groups around the book. So just a way to bring people together to really uh, have these conversations. So those that was my vision for the uses of the book. And as I said, my vision for the structure of the book was really about um, these different parts mind, body, heart, will, spirit, so that anyone 
picking up the book can find a way into it, depending, you know, we all have different approaches to this topic. And for some of us, it might be more mental, more emotional, more spiritual, more physical, so that everyone would have a way to, to begin to get into the book. And the, uh, the selections are quite short from the longer prose pieces. Um, and that's why there are so many uh, different pieces in the book. And I felt that creates a kind of a chorus, a, a sense of just, as you've spoken about yourself, the sisterhood uh, across continents, across centuries that connects us together. And that was important to me to keep that rhythm going uh, with you know, no, no pieces more than just a few pages long or very few of them. Yes, absolutely. I think that's what makes this anthology such a riveting read, despite it being such a serious subject, which um, actually brings me to the question of conversations and how could we as readers approach this anthology to understand all the finer nuances of abortion? How can we have healthy conversations on the subject without it being reduced to social stigma or a medical procedure which is hotly contested in courts of law and in religion, but mentioned in whispers among family and friends. Um, so um, I'm also very interested in your next, con your next question, how can we have a healthy conversation about abortion without it being reduced to a social stigma or a medical procedure? How can we stop talking about abortion in whispers? To me, this really gets to the heart of the whole issue. And um, I feel this is one of the reasons the human species survived for all these millennia is because of the power of women together to, um, to make great decisions and to come up with the best possible answer, not about the individual ego or uh, competition or hierarchy as much as just let's come up with a really good practical uh, and beautiful solution that makes everyone happy. It's a, a characteristic, the scholar Heidi gutner Appendroth says this is a characteristic of matrilineal societies, consensus decision making. And um, I think this is exactly the way to approach healthy conversations about abortion in this spirit that none of us is alone. That uh, when we make a decision for reproductive freedom or a reproductive decision at all, we are making the decision for the sake of everyone's good. Our own, certainly, our own good is part of the good for everyone. But um, in that spirit that I think women often have, which is that there isn't really a choice between one person's good or another, but that there are win-win solutions. There are ways to, um, to look at the whole that are bigger than the individual. And if we can start having these kinds of conversations about abortion, where we can speak openly and freely about our experiences, about our choices, our desires, and share that with our sisters, and just not think of it as our own cross to bear, our own individual uh, issue to handle, but more something that um, is for the good of everyone. I think that would be a very good first step to have these conversations. And I hope that this book will make these conversations start to happen in a way that they haven't before, or will help them start to happen. There are um, discussion guides for the book that you can download on the website that have questions, and there are a lot of women already starting discussion groups where they talk about the book together, and that makes me very happy. Thanks so much for that, Annie. Um, regarding conversations, I'd like to add that there's a standalone website dedicated to having discussions and events among friends or sharing your own story, and that website is choicewordsaction.org. So my last question to you, Annie, is that we're living in unprecedented times. And I want to ask, how has it been to have choice words come out during a pandemic where access to medical care and procedures have been challenging to say the least, among them abortions, and how not having any sense of control affects the choices we make regarding our own bodies. How do we safeguard and assert our reproductive rights in a time of social and political uncertainty? So um, your question about what it's like for the book to come out during a pandemic and how do we safeguard our rights during this time of social and political uncertainty? What a wonderful question. 
Um, to have the book come out at this time was interesting. I was planning a huge tour. I was going to go to 12 different bookstores across the United States, and that was all canceled. And instead, I'm doing uh, more virtual things. And I, I have to say that I'm, I'm actually glad. It's been a much quieter launch, but I think that may be appropriate. Um, I feel that this book may be like watering a plant at the root, more quietly soaking in and uh, creating value in, in people's lives in that sort of deeper way as opposed to a torrential rainstorm that comes down and happens all at once. So um, I think it may be, may be nicer to have the book begin to spread through these discussion groups and through these online appearances and have people just begin to start to talk about it and get ready for it and, uh, and maybe the book will have a longer and quieter launch in that way. Um, in this time of political and social uncertainty, it is easy to be discouraged. However, I find that, as they say, the ancient Chinese um, saying something along the lines of every crisis is an opportunity, I do feel that this is a possibly very exciting time to make real steps forward. Um, which is already happening um, in the United States with the Black Lives Matter protests, which I don't think ever would have been so big if it weren't for the pandemic. And I think it's a chance for a new way of envisioning our priorities. Do we want economic growth at all costs, or do we want clean air and water? Do we want uh, unbridled capitalist competition, or do we want a more humane system? where people have a chance to, to relax and enjoy each other and to feel that we have enough and that uh, there is enough to go around if we look in the big picture. Um, uh, this is, I think, a chance to witness a lot of the old ways falling apart very quickly. And it can be frightening, but it's also an incredible time for opportunity and for starting new conversations, new priorities, and for feeling our own freedom, for feeling our ways of doing things that haven't been done before, um, for feeling just our, the potential that we have to imagine ourselves in new ways. Once again, thank you so much for this very important discussion, Annie. I agree that because of the pandemic, people are sitting up and they are paying more attention to issues of the mind, heart, and body, and that this is indeed an opportunity to start conversations anew. To learn more about Choice Words, please visit anniefinch.com slash choice words. Also, please do check out the companion reading of work from Choice Words here at the Bangalore Poetry Festival this year by South Asian writers. Be safe and be well. Namaskara. Namaskara, hello, and welcome to the 2020 edition of the Bangalore Poetry Festival. I'm Shikha Malvia, and today we are gathered here to share pieces from the landmark anthology, Choice Words, Writers on Abortion, edited by Annie Finch. If you haven't already, do check out the conversation I had with Annie Finch as part of this festival regarding how and why Choice Words came to be. Choice Words comprises poems, stories, and essays which recognize, validate, document, and explore the experience of abortion. This anthology was 20 years in the making, spurred by the editor Annie Finch's own painful decision to have an abortion. And on seeking literature that addressed the subject, she discovered it was not easily available nor accessible, though she was confident such literature existed. The result of Annie's search is Choice Words, a riveting and moving anthology that cuts across centuries and geographies, organized into five intuitive sections. Mind, body, heart, will, and spirit. Mind focuses on the often very difficult and painful decision to have an abortion. Body focuses on the actual physical experience. Heart on the emotional aspects will on exercising choice and what that involved, and finally, spirit, which looks at abortion through a spiritual lens. 
Joining me today to share their work, work on choice words are writers Sonia Kamal, Manisha Sharma, and Pratibha Kinapure, who I'm happy to add are also my friends. Thank you so much for being here. Before reading our work, I would love for all of us to briefly share why we wrote our pieces and which section it comes under in the anthology. So we'll begin with Manisha Sharma. Manisha is a poet and a fiction writer. Her work has been published in The Fourth River, Arkansan Review, Tab, and is forthcoming in Arts and Letters, The Madison Review, and other fine journals. She is the 2020 winner of the Causeway Lit Poetry Award and a semi-finalist for the Cultural Weekly Poetry Prize. Manisha earned an MFA from Virginia Tech and is currently a lecturer in English and yoga at New River Community College in Virginia. Welcome, Manisha. Thank you. So uh, I had been separately uh, working on the issue of female feticide in India uh, for over a decade now. And um, so I had been involved in writing about female feticide from multiple perspectives. Uh, I also did a bunch of research in the field and realized that uh, there was a lot of confusion about what exactly is the state complicated by several reasons. And so, uh, my poetry was a sort of meditation, like after I had those conversations with people. And uh, this was the best way it could take. So when uh, Shikha introduced me to Annie and to this call for poetry related to abortion, um, it just seemed like a perfect fit. And actually I wrote this poem for this anthology. Um, so yeah, and I think uh, the editor put it very correctly in the mind section, because I believe the decision whether to have a child or not uh, first starts at the level of the mind. And the disturbance also continues in the mind based on what you decided and what you did not, especially when you actually never were that 100% sure whether it was a girl or a boy. Um, so I think my piece fits in very well uh, in the mind section. Do you want me to go ahead and read right now? Absolutely, yes, please. <laughs> right, so, um, so for, for the last decade, uh, about six to seven million girls have been aborted before birth in our country, India. And that, so once you figure out whether it's a girl or a boy, and that process is also illegal, you find out ways to eliminate that unborn child, which perhaps is a girl. And that's what female feticide stands for. Um, my poem is called, You Have No Name, No Grave, No Identity. And I start uh, this poem with a quotation from uh, one, of our, one of the research activists who has been very vocal about this issue in uh, India, he's in New Delhi, named Sabu M. George. So uh, I'll begin with his quote and then answer the poem. Uh, it goes like, more girls in India and China are eliminated every year than the number of girls born in the United States. Over the last decade, 6 million plus girls were eliminated before birth in India, <coughs> more than the number of Jews killed in the Holocaust by the Nazis. And here is the poem. Praise be to the goddess, the curly-haired mother of two boys, my gynecologist, who in quote for, it's a girl, a DNC must be done. At dawn for your father's lunch, I seal the lid on hot tomato tempered dal, two pale hued roti discs, crescent shaped grains of brown rice, a fistful, sour yogurt, a measured cup. I pack for myself in a straw basket, a cotton sari, blouse, petticoat, a bundle of soft racks for post-procedure. Drowned under loads of reams of razor-edged pages, your father. Drowned under unexplainable jars of illness, your grandmother. Your uncle drops me a block from the clinic on the corner of X and Y. Collapsed on a sterile sanitary pad-shaped stretcher, I feel. My hospital gowned body sensing cool clinic sheets. My groggy eyes seem disappearing green drapes. My fingers pinching my nose to ward off sharp disinfectant. 
my ears hearing stretcher wheels squeaking like rats chewing away old linen in the luxury of the night. On my right, white tray on a white table, foggy forceps. Scissors that grow bold and big, then shrink again like raisins I soak every night for your father. Everything is a blank, an erased memory. All I know is this. You will have no name, no grave, no identity, my girl. You would have been my second child. Next, we have Pratibha Kelapure. Pratibha is an Indian American poet residing in California. She's an autodidact out of necessity and has been writing poetry for a long time. She recently completed several highly reputed poetry workshops, including Annie Finch's Rhythm Workshop. Apart from choice words, Pratibha's work has appeared in Plath Poetry Project, Miller's Pond Poetry, The Lake, and many other literary magazines. She is the editor of the online poetry journal, The Literary Nest. Welcome, Pratibha. Thank you. Okay, here we go. So, uh, hi everybody. Uh, this is my first time reading at this festival. Um, about this anthology, I am a poet and not an activist. This poem was written before uh, I saw this call uh, from Annie. The poem was inspired by uh, State of Indiana resident Purvi Patel case in 2013. The case itself is mired in controversy and issues of arcane laws and its enforcement as a tool for race and gender discrimination. From the social point of view, it, it's a tragedy of an Indian, Indian family their premarital sex, even by an independent adult, is shunned upon. The fact that a 33-year-old woman was afraid of telling her parents and seek a lawful abortion is deeply troubling. The poem itself is an amalgam of several stories of abortions. The resounding impact of abortion is the silence of everyone involved. This profound silence and shame leading to complete blocking of any emotional response is the theme of this poem. And I wanted to show this silence rather than talk about it. Uh, this poem appears in the heart section of the anthology and that's where it belongs. Uh, shall I go ahead and read? Yes, sure. I'm ready to read, okay. Please do. The poem is titled, Interred. Uh, for Purvi Patel and countless other women in India and anywhere else in the world. How do you speak of an event that didn't happen? Time goes by and you don't trust your memory. Held for so long, it's impossible to bear the truth. You remember it well, but no one else does because no one else knew about the weekend you spent holed up in an old hovel of a clinic while blood, hope, and the whisper of a life flowed away. Now, no one would believe it. It doesn't fit the frame of the flawless family picture. It's easier to forget, pretend, and propagate the family lore. You hate to disturb other people's dreams always altering your own narrative to fit theirs, to bury your hurts and deny your suffering and simply carry the elephant of guilt on your shoulder until your heart is buried too deep to pulse with life. Thank you, Pratika. That, that was beautiful. And the way you talk about silence and memory, um, that's very, very moving. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and now we have Sonia Kamal. Sonia is an award-winning novelist, essayist, and public speaker. Her novel, Unmarriageable, Pride and Prejudice in Pakistan, is a Financial Times Reader's Best Book of 2019, a People Magazine's pick, a 2020 Georgia Author of the Year for Literary Fiction nominee, and um, her debut novel, An Isolated Incident, was shortlisted for the Townside Prize Townsend Prize and was the KLF French Fiction Prize. 
Sonia's work has appeared in critically acclaimed anthologies and publications, including The New York Times, The Guardian, The TEDx Stage, Georgia Review, The Bitter Southerner, Catapult, and more. Thank you, Sonia, for being with us. Um, thank you, uh, Shika and Bangalore Lit Fest for inviting me to participate on this panel and of course to be part of this uh, groundbreaking anthology. Um, my piece is a nonfiction essay um, and it is based on four interviews that I took uh, of uh, four different young women over, over, over the years. It was, um, you know, as Patava mentioned, premarital sex is no, uh, quite taboo in, in uh, Desi diaspora cultures, South Asian cultures, definitely in Pakistan. And um, so most of the abortions here were a result of that. And to get women to open up and talk about it was, was quite a task. And I, I decided to write them rather than interview style as reenactments. So this is their stories and their voices. And I reenacted the, the interviews that they gave me. I put them together and, and reenacted them. Um, or I used pseudonyms throughout because um, no one is going to <laughs> come out and say it is them. So this is my essay uh, and included in the body part, which seems very right because a lot of the um, all four uh, reenactments interviews um, focus on the uh, on what happens to the body. Yes, the mind, the decisions we make, uh, but also the body and also the spirit and what it does afterwards. The little section I'm going to read is from. Uh, Amina. The essay is called The Scarlet A, and this is from Amina, the first girl, 1995. And she finds herself in a backstreet abortion clinic, basically a garage turned into a makeshift clinic, dirty, there's a gurney, and um, this is what she goes through. So she's talking to the doctor. She tells me she's going to scrape the lining of my uterus and that I will feel some pressure. She bows between my legs and I hear a muffled roar like a vacuum cleaner. An excruciating spasm begins in my lower abdomen. I once stepped on an anthill and was bitten so badly I felt my foot was on fire. This was worse. This was boiling, acid, blistering, devouring, disintegrating my insides. I scream. The doctor slaps my inner thigh. She says, shut up. I whimper. She slaps me again. Shut up or I will stop. The doc says, doctor says that her husband is just beyond the garage door leading from the side room clinic into the house. What, she demands, is he going to think is happening in here if he hears you? I bite my tongue. I try to think happy thoughts. I scream again. The doctor stops the machine. She says one more sound and she half punches my exposed tummy and I will send you home with the deed half done. I can hear my baby being sucked out. I had wanted to deliver this baby and give it up for abortion. Sorry. I had wanted to deliver this baby and give it up for adoption, but all I have to offer is death. I would like to see the remains, but I'm scared I'll be denied this request, and I do not want the doctor to have further control. For the first time, I fully fathom the gulf between the crimes of a man and the crimes of a woman. As I lie there, the clock ticking, my uterus being cleansed, I realize I hate this culture, which has forced me to kill my baby. But my culture will say I only have myself to blame. I had premarital sex, and it is fitting that I suffer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was very powerful, very visceral, and um, I know when I when I read it, I start to get it's it's a it's a hard it was very hard to write and it's very hard to read also because yeah. you know, the immediacy of of it all. Thank you. Thank you. And, and lastly, I'll be sure my own poem. For those who uh, might not know me, I'm a poet and writer currently residing in California, like Priva. I'm co-founder of the Great Indian Poetry Collective, a mentorship model press publishing innovative poetic voices from India and the Indian diaspora. My book of poems is Geography of Tongues, which was received very warmly, um, both in India and abroad. And I'm happy to say more books are to follow very, very soon. 
To learn more about all the writers that have been featured in this reading and festival, please visit the festival website at bangalurupoetryfestival.org. So I've always believed in poetry as a form of activism and looking at all the poems in choice words, that is proof for me that it is. For me, the words of poet and activist Audre Lorde ring so true where she says, for women, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. I feel poetry is such a powerful window to frame women's experiences and voices. The poem which I'll be sharing with you addresses a very different aspect of, of abortion. Um, and um, it's something I think that Manisha also talked about a little bit. Um, and it's um, an aspect of abortion that has emerged out of a more traditional patriarchal society, which favors the birth of boys over girls. And in most, if not all cases, a choice the woman carrying the child has not made. According to statistics from the United Nations, there are 50 million more boys than girls in India under the age of 20. Sex selective abortions, despite being illegal, are still performed to this day. And uh, my poem is featured in the heart section of Choice Words. So. Of the missing 50 million. In the celestial realm of abandoned girls, you will find all parts, tiny fingers and toes, thumbnail sized hearts, silver anklets barely an inch wide, hole to ward off the evil eye, and tiny ovaries dotting the skies. Rupees 5,000 for a simple operation saves you a dowry of 50,000, for daughters are a father's burden, legs closed, mouths open, decked in red when they are wed. We welcome the bride as Lakshmi, goddess of wealth, uttering blessings of them one. Putravati Bhava, be the mother of a son. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for sharing um, your very, very moving pieces. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope our words will give all of you watching the inspiration to engage in the issues presented and have thoughtful conversations on abortion and reproductive rights. Choice Words is available in the United States from the publishers, Haymarket Books, other bookstores, bookstores, and online, of course, and will hopefully be available in India within the next year. Namaskar.